In this video, I want to answer the question of whether you should soak or sprout your grains and legumes before eating them. To do this, we will look at studies as well as so-called old wisdom from traditional diets to try to give you a good and practical answer. At the end of the video, you will also find a quick guide on how to soak and sprout your foods correctly. Let's get started. Grains and legumes have been consumed across the globe and as part of many traditional diets for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It wasn't until recently that we started to really question whether they were good or bad for us. Eliminating grains and legumes from your diet is kind of a trend right now. You have paleo and other primal diets that outright tell you to avoid them at all costs. On the other hand, you also have people saying that they are fine as long as you prepare them in the proper traditional way. So what is this all about? and what should you do to optimize your diet. Probably the best place to start here is to talk about anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients are, as the name suggests, certain compounds, mostly found in plant foods, that can block the absorption of other nutrients. They were developed by plants to protect them from bacterial infections and being eaten by insects. While many foods have some anti-nutrients, they are most prominent in grains, legumes, nuts. This, of course, makes them a particular concern for anyone who eats a lot of these foods, such as vegetarians and vegans. But to be honest, I believe other people should be concerned as well, simply because grains, nuts, and legumes are part of a well-rounded diet that everyone should eat, even if you don't rely on them as heavily as vegans, for example. The most well-known and best-studied anti-nutrients include, first, phytic acid. This is found in seeds, grains, and legumes, and reduces the absorption of minerals from all the other foods that are consumed together with the phytic acid. Common minerals that phytic acid will bind to include iron, zinc, magnesium, and calcium. And when this happens, the new compound is called a phytate. Next, you have lectins. Lectins are found in basically all food plants, but again, especially in seeds, legumes, and grains. Like phytic acid, they can interfere with the absorption of nutrients, especially calcium, iron, phosphorus, and zinc. And third, we have oxalates, which are found in green leafy vegetables, tea, beans, nuts, and beets. They like to bind to calcium and prevent it from being absorbed. What you can see when you look at these anti-nutrient categories is that all of them basically bind to essential minerals in your GI tract, which means you will be ingesting less of them, which ultimately can lead to all kinds of deficiencies. There are also other anti-nutrients, such as tannins and protease inhibitors, that work slightly different, but you will read about them a lot less. So, after we've now talked about what anti-nutrients are, the next question is, how do we reduce them and should you even care about them at all? This question goes hand in hand with the overarching topic of this video, which is if you should soak and sprout grains and legumes to reduce the effect of these anti-nutrients. The research on soaking and sprouting is pretty clear. In basically all cases, it does reduce anti-nutrient content in food. Although how much depends on the individual grain slash legume and the method that is being used. For example, one study found that soaking pigeon peas for 6 to 18 hours, decreased lectins by 38 to 50 percent, tannins by 13 to 25 percent, and protease inhibitors by 28 to 30 percent. On the other hand, soaking only reduced the anti-nutrient content of kidney beans slightly. And to be honest, when reading other literature on anti-nutrients and how to avoid them, you will notice over and over again how contradictory the evidence really is. On the one hand, they are a problem for optimal nutrient absorption. But on the other hand, there also exist studies that link anti-nutrients to cancer reduction, high antioxidant levels, and better gut health. That's why some health experts even say we shouldn't worry about them at all, meaning we also don't need to worry about soaking and sprouting. So for you as the average person, what do you do with this conflicting evidence? What are the takeaway points here? First, and this goes with anything nutrition-related, it always comes down to you as the individual. 
If your diet relies heavily on grains rich in phytic acid and other anti-nutrients, you should probably give soaking and sprouting a try. The same applies to anyone with a grain, nut or legume sensitivity. Most of these can be minimized through proper food preparation and will make your diet a lot more enjoyable. Of course, I'm talking about sensitivities here, not allergies. Those should always be checked with your doctor because they're a lot more dangerous. For anyone else, I recommend you keep anti-nutrients in the back of your head, but don't freak out about them. The reason I say this is because even though many health bloggers advocate for a lectin-free or phytic acid-free diet, the literature on this is still so unclear that such a drastic suggestion is overblown in my opinion. To be honest, what concerns me the most aren't the anti-nutrient foods themselves. They have been consumed by many cultures across the globe. It's more the fact that only recently we seem to have forgotten about the traditional way of preparing them, which almost always included some type of soaking or sprouting. If we look at traditional diets from around the world, so basically all the diets that existed before modern food processing, almost all of them did something with their grains before eating them. Some cultures soaked or sprouted, while others fermented, for example, when making sourdough bread. Or they might have roasted nuts and seeds in the sun before eating them. The effect of these preparation methods is always the same. It makes nutrients more available and the foods more easy to digest. I personally believe that there is a lot of truth in these traditional methods of preparation and it's the reason I do soak most grains before eating them. But like I said before, I'm also not a big fan of freaking people out about anti-nutrients and telling you what you can and can't eat. To wrap up this video, if you decide to soak or sprout, here's a quick guide on how to do it correctly. There are countless protocols online and most are either very time intensive or complicated. So I try to keep this as simple yet effective as possible. Let's start with soaking, which is super simple for most foods. Step one is to place the grain or legume into a bowl and to cover it completely with warm water. The hydration of the grain results in an enzymatic action that reduces the anti-nutrients. Step 2, and this is optional, some people like to add an acidic medium such as lemon juice, apple cider vinegar or cultured dairy because it helps to further break down anti-nutrients as well as fibers. If you do this, you need roughly one tablespoon of acidic medium for every one cup of liquid. And step 3. Now place your bowl on the countertop and cover it with a clean towel or a small plate. In step 4, you let everything soak. Most grains need to be soaked for 12 to 24 hours and you can find the individual times with a quick Google search. Although some such as buckwheat or brown rice only need around 7 hours soaking time. Legumes such as beans should soak for at least 8 to 10 hours, with larger beans needing more time than smaller ones. If you just want to soak your foods, the process can stop here. If however you also want to sprout, here's what should happen next. In step 5, essentially what you will be doing during the sprouting phase is watering your plant. So just rinse it with filtered water several times per day, with a minimum of twice per day. The objective is to rinse and drain the rest of the water off. If you have a sprouting jar, this can easily be done by placing it in the kitchen dish drying rack, so all the excess water goes right down the sink while giving the seeds enough air circulation to grow. Sprouting jars can be bought online and they come with specific lids. In step 6 you wait. Over time as the grain or legume starts to sprout, you'll see a tiny tail coming from the seed. This means it's growing and sprouting. This process can take between 1 and 4 days and you will know it's finished when the seeds have small tails or if they've sprouted greens. Once this is done, you should store your sprouts in the fridge and use them within 3 to 4 days for optimal nutrient density. So there you have it. That's my guide to soaking and sprouting grains and legumes. Unfortunately, I couldn't give you a one size fits all approach here, but to be honest, with the current state of nutrition research, no one can. I hope you still found it useful and maybe want to try it out yourself.